Hey, welcome to another weekend message. I'm Pastor Bill Thomas out at Hereford Faith and Life Church in Moncton, Maryland. And I want to greet you in the name of the Lord and pray that everything is going well in your life. We want to uh, continue our Lenten series today, but first let's just pray for each other and then we will uh, uh, share this incredible, incredible event that happens uh, in the 11th uh, chapter of the Gospel of John. Heavenly Father, thank you for your love and your grace, your mercy, your kindness, your goodness. Lord, we uh, offer you our hearts right now. Lord, we, we pray that you would open our spiritual eyes and ears to hear your word and to be touched by your Holy Spirit and to let the word of God conform us and strengthen us and comfort us. For we ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen and amen. So let me share screen with you, and I want to go through just a couple of very important things that are happening. If you're in our area, the Moncton, Hereford area in uh, Baltimore County, stop by uh, Good Friday, uh, March 29th, uh, 7 o'clock in our sanctuary. We'll have a Good Friday service. I always tell people you really can't appreciate Easter, um, Easter morning without a Good Friday service, a remembrance, a recalling of the uh, awful price that Jesus paid for our salvation, for the forgiveness of our sins at the cross. So if you're in the area, please stop by. That will be in our sanctuary. Uh, it'll be a, a very traditional service and would love you to come. And then Easter Sunday, uh, if you're around, um, we're going to have two worship services, uh, 9 a.m. We are in our Family Life Center uh, it's a contemporary service. We'll be singing and praising God. There's a Sunday school, there's nursery, and there's a King's Cafe afterwards where we can fellowship. 11 o'clock is our traditional service in our beautiful sanctuary. Either way, if you're in our area, come and spend Easter with us. So this Lenten season, we've been doing a series uh, called They Met Jesus, and we've been looking at a variety of people that Jesus encountered and changed their lives. Now, today being Palm Sunday, let's just review. Uh, Jesus uh, comes riding into Jerusalem on a donkey, and a massive crowd uh, gathered to welcome him. They are waving palm branches and laying down their outer garments in the road for the donkey to walk on. And they were yelling, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And Jesus, uh, one of the reasons why this crowd, this massive crowd is there is because of what happened just a couple weeks earlier in a town just two miles away from the city gates called Bethany. And everybody in Jerusalem was talking about it because Jesus raised a man from the dead who was well known in that holy city. And he did it in front of hundreds of people who I'm sure uh, ran back to Jerusalem and report of this miracle just literally spread like wildfire. And when you heard that Jesus was coming into town, you, you wanted to see him. And everybody wanted to uh, get a, catch a glimpse of this rabbi, this prophet, the, the supposed Messiah named Jesus the Christ. So we're going to go to John chapter 11, and we're going to be looking at one of the most epic events, I believe, uh, recorded in the New Testament. There are casts, a cast of hundreds in the background, but at center stage, stage are two sisters named Mary and Martha and uh, their brother, Lazarus. Now, this family, we've met them before, if you recall. In fact, uh, they had become dear friends and believers uh, of Jesus and probably were financial supporters of his ministry. And But on this day, they met Jesus in such an encounter that their lives would be forever changed, and not just their lives, but the whole world stood and took notice. Let me read you uh, the scripture. If you have your Bibles open to John chapter 11, we'll start with verse 1. A man named Lazarus was sick. He lived in Bethany with his sisters, Mary and Martha. This is the Mary who poured the expensive perfume on the Lord's feet and wiped them with her hair. This happens in John chapter 12, just six days before the Passover. Her brother, Lazarus, was sick. So the two sisters sent a message to Jesus telling him, Lord, the one you love is very sick. But when Jesus heard about it, he said, Lazarus' sickness will not end in death. No, it is for the glory of God. For I, the Son of God, will receive glory from this. 
And although Jesus loved Martha, Mary, and Lazarus, he stayed where he was for the next two days and did not go to them. Finally, after two days, he said to his disciples, let's go to Judea again. Then he said, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but now I will go and wake him up. The disciples said, Lord, if he's sleeping, that means he's getting better. They thought Jesus meant Lazarus was having a good night's rest, but Jesus meant Lazarus had died. Then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. Folks, that's where a Christian death is always referred to as sleep, right? Not permanent. Verse 15, and for your sake, I'm glad I wasn't there because this will give you another opportunity to believe in me. Come, let's go to see him. When Jesus arrived at Bethany, arrived, he was told that Lazarus had already been in his grave for four days. Bethany was only a few miles down the road from Jerusalem. Many other people had come to pay their respects and console Mary and Martha on their loss. When Martha got word that Jesus was coming, she ran to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if only you'd been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know God will give you whatever you ask. And Jesus told her, your brother will rise again. Yes, Martha said, when everyone else rises on the resurrection day. And Jesus told her, I am the resurrection and life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, like everyone else, will live again. They are given eternal life for believing in me and will never perish. Do you believe this, Martha? Yes, Lord, she told him. I have always believed you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one who has come into the world from God. Then she left him and returned to Mary. She called Mary aside from the mourners and told her, the teacher is here. He wants to see you. So Mary immediately went to him. And when the people who were at the house trying to console Mary saw her leave so hastily, they assumed she was going to Lazarus' grave to weep. So they followed her there. And when Mary arrived, they saw Jesus. She fell down at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and saw the other people wailing with her, he was moved with indignation, was deeply troubled. Where have you put him? She asked them. They told him, Lord, come and see. Then Jesus wept. The people who were standing nearby said, see how much he loved him. But some said, this man healed a blind man. Why couldn't he keep Lazarus from dying? And again, Jesus was deeply troubled. And then they came to the grave. It was a cave with a stone rolled across his entrance. Roll the stone aside, Jesus told them. But Martha, the dead man's sister, said, Lord, by now, the smell will be terrible. He's been dead for four days. Jesus responded, didn't I tell you that you'll see God's glory if you believe? So they rolled the stone aside. When Jesus then looked up to heaven and said, Father, thank you for hearing me. You always hear me. But I said it out loud for the sake of those standing here, so they will believe you sent me. Then Jesus shouted, Lazarus, come out. And Lazarus came out bound in grave clothes, his face wrapped in a head cloth. And Jesus told them, unwrap him and let him go. Listen, I, I don't care who you are. Crisis is a part of life. Sometimes you can see a crisis brewing on the horizon like a storm, like thunderclouds on the horizon. But oftentimes it catches us like a stray bolt of lightning, doesn't it? I mean, one moment life is just as normal as can be. And then in a blink of an eye, one phone call, one word from your doctor, one trip in the car, the, the rug is just pulled out from under you and your life is turned upside down. Well, we've all experienced crisis, that's for sure, from minor to major. And if you haven't, I would suggest take good notes because you'll have one. It's called life here on planet earth. I remember my first six months uh, in ministry here at Hereford Faith and Life Church, I, my very first day on the job, I totaled my new car. Someone had pulled out in front of me. I went into a guardrail we had our outdoor pool uh, fall apart. It was an above ground pool and the water went streaming into our basement and put about 18 inches of water in our basement. And then a couple months later, my wife, Linda, had brain surgery. So listen, I, I'm not sharing uh, the, the, the word today from some theory or formula that I read in a book somewhere. The, these truths have come from the furnace of affliction. And, and listen, I feel fortunate. Those things seem minor compared to some of the things you faced or are facing right now or will face. So again, I want to encourage you to take notes because this will not only help you face times in your own personal crisis, but it will equip you to minister and help others in moments of need. Now, there are three foundational truths 
that Martha and Mary and even Lazarus learned from this encounter with Jesus. And there are three truths that we need to know when we face a crisis. The first will have to do with God's will, right? Uh, why would God let this happen? Where, where is God in all of this? Doesn't he care about what I'm going through? Those are natural questions. The second one has to do with God's timing. You know, why isn't God answering my prayer right now? I need him to answer now. And the third one has to do with God's power. The, the, the thought, the doubt, well, God, can God really help me? I mean, is he strong enough and powerful enough, caring enough to get me through this? So let's look at these one at a time. First, let's talk about the first lesson Mary, Martha, and even Lazarus learn about God's will. And here's the first thing. God's will and our will are not always the same. Can you say amen? You say, well, that's pretty obvious, isn't it? In fact, they're, they're uh, I wouldn't say never the same, but they're rarely the same. But you know what? As we grow in Christ and we mature uh, in him, you know, it's fascinating. Our will and our desires will be more in sync with God's. But most of the time, God's will is nothing like what I want God to do. Isaiah chapter 55, verses 8 and 9, it reads this way. This is God speaking. My thoughts are completely different from yours, says the Lord, and my ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. And here's why God's will is, is usually so different from ours. We don't see the whole picture, but God does. My, my thoughts on the matter are not his thoughts. My way is not his ways because God always has the bigger picture. He's always looking at the past, future, and uh, at the same time, past, present, and future, uh, all the time. When we go through Christ, I know, uh, speaking for me, I, I tend to have tunnel vision. Man, I become laser focused on the problem and I lose sight of the greater purposes and plans that God has for me. And what we need to grasp when we're going through a crisis is that God has that big picture. He sees the past, present, and future. And he says, uh, uh, you know, that I can take care of you. Verse 4, chapter 11 it says, But when Jesus heard about this, he said, Lazarus' sickness is will not end in death. Now, he was telling the truth here. Uh, the sickness would not end in death, but he was sharing that God had a different plan, right? Here's what he continues to say. Jesus says, no, it is for the glory of God. I, the son of God, will receive glory from him. So God was planning this. Jesus knew what was going to happen. He had a will. He had a purpose. It certainly wasn't Mary and Martha. I'm sure it wasn't Lazarus who died. But this crisis about you know, Lazarus' sickness wasn't so much about Lazarus as it was about a demonstration of the power and glory of Jesus Christ and also his compassion. Lazarus being raised from the dead, I mean, four days in the, after four days in the tomb, it's a precursor, it's a foreshadowing of Jesus himself who would be raised from the dead after three days in the grave, after his crucifixion and burial. But I know the struggles you and I go through, the crisis, the troubles, the problems, are not so much as they are about God showing us, uh, you know, our, our need. It's about God showing us that he has a bigger picture. It's not so much about us. It's about him showing us he has a bigger, better plan and will use whatever circumstances necessary to make it happen. And which brings a question. People say, well, well is God behind my crisis? Did God cause Lazarus to become gravely ill and die? No, not at all. The scripture says God is light. In him is no darkness at all. Well, did he allow it to happen? Yes, he did. Why? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know why he allows things to come into our lives because they come into everybody's lives. No one is exempt. But I know this, that in the midst of crisis, he wants us to trust him. He cares for us. He loves us. And through your crisis, God will receive glory. Romans 8, 28, one of my favorite verses. It says, God causes all things to work together for good for those who love God are called according to his purpose. So we may be totally confused and undone, unable to sleep or eat, worried to death. 
But the Bible assures us God is not frantically pacing heaven, wringing his hands, worrying. He's not saying, oh me, what's going to happen? Now, Mary and Martha, they're shaken to the core, and rightfully so. Their dear brother, Lazarus, is critically ill, and we can assume that they probably tried everything humanly possible, probably got every doctor in Jerusalem, every specialist to no avail. Their last desperate attempt was to get Jesus on the scene as fast as possible. And again, I imagine they were worried sick. But look at Jesus. Does he seem the least bit shook at all when he hears the news Lazarus is sick? Does he seem the least bit worried or concerned? His response is basically, hey, no problem. I think I'll stay right here and uh, stay by the pool a few more days, right? Uh, remember, this is the same Jesus who was fast asleep in the middle of a killer storm out on the Sea of Galilee when his veteran sailors were scared spitless. <laughs> When crisis barges into our lives, we need to remember that God is in control. God's not worried. God isn't in shock. This crisis didn't take him by surprise. In fact, we can say with total assurance that nothing happens in our lives that hasn't first been sifted through God's sovereign and permissive will for us. Nothing. God is in control. Now, the second fact about God's will is this, is that God's will always reveals his purpose, whether we recognize it or not. Verse 37, but some said, this man healed a blind man. Why couldn't he keep Lazarus from dying? Hey, no one, not, not Mary or Martha, certainly not Lazarus, nor any of Jesus' disciples had a clue to what Jesus was up to, what he was about to do. He was going to raise Lazarus from the dead after being four days in the tomb. They didn't know that, but Jesus did. That's why he wasn't shaken. God knew, and God is God, and we're not. You ever tried to play God? I have many times, and I'm terrible at it. God has a plan, even if we don't recognize it. The prophet Jeremiah, chapter 10, verse 23 he writes, I know, Lord, that a person's life is not his own. No one is able to plan his own course. So correct me, Lord, but please be gentle. <laughs> please be gentle. Then further on in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 29, 11, is that great verse we probably have memorized. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They're plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. Here's the third thing about God's will we need to look at. That God's will always brings him glory as he reveals more of himself to us and to the world. Again, listen to verse 36, or I mean 38. And again, Jesus was deeply troubled. Then he came to the grave and it was a cave with a stone rolled across its entrance. Roll the stone aside, Jesus told them. But Martha, the dead man's sister said, Lord, by now the smell will be terrible because he's been dead for four days. And Jesus responded, didn't I tell you that you'll see God's glory if you believe? Listen, you answer, what would bring Jesus more glory? Healing a sick man who may have recovered anyway, he's already healed a lot of sick people, or raising a man who'd been dead for four days in the tomb, whose body has already begun to de decay and decompose. Now, Jesus knew what he was doing. He planned it this way so people would be astounded by the power of God and would turn to him and believe in him. I mean, wouldn't it... You've loved to have been there that day. I sure would have to see Lazarus raised up. What a savior. What, what a king. What a God. Even if I didn't believe that, I would have believed after that. And when God brings us through our crisis and our troubled times, listen, the pew and you and the people around you, listen, they will, they will give glory to God because they've seen him in action in your life. God is real, they'll say. God cares. And they'll give him the glory. Now, the second foundational truth that Martha, Mary, and Lazarus had to learn with, learn about was God's timing. God's timing. And here's the first fact. God's timing is perfect. Always perfect. Never too early. Never too late. Always on time. Romans chapter 5, verse 6, Paul writes, When we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time 
and died for sinners. Now, I know God's timing is intricately woven with his will. But watch what happens here. Mary and Martha's messengers find Jesus. They explain the crisis. And Jesus doesn't jump on his motorcycle and speed to Bethany, which shocks his disciples. In verse uh, 5, it says, Although Jesus loved Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, he stayed where he was for the next two days and didn't go to them. And you'd be thinking, wow, what's, what's that about? It looks like Jesus doesn't care. It appears as if he doesn't really love these three, uh, th this family. What's up? I mean, isn't that how you and I feel when you pray and God doesn't immediately answer? You know, I know it's how I feel sometimes. Isn't God supposed to appear every time we rub the lamp at our call and beckon? Uh, I am sure his disciples were stunned. I mean, Jesus really cared about this family, like he cares for every one of us. And I bet they had some interesting private conversations among themselves those two days they were waiting. But God's timing is always perfect. He wanted to raise Lazarus from an impossible, a natural situation. Secondly, God's timing is always, always for his glory, not ours. And this is exactly what Jesus told his disciples. He said, this sickness is not about Lazarus, but it's for the glory of God. I will receive glory out of this. And then finally, in verse 7, after two days, he said, let's go to Judea again. And when Jesus arrived in Bethany, he found out that Lazarus had been dead four days. And first comes Martha, later comes Mary. They run out to me. They say the exact same thing, each sister. Jesus if you had come here when we asked you to come, if you had been here, Lazarus would still be alive. People, it's all about God's will and God's timing. God's purpose was to glorify Jesus, that many would believe him to be the long-awaited Messiah. And God's timing was such that Lazarus had to be dead, but not in a coma, not, not just passed out or nearly dead, but so dead his body was decomposing the smell. No, no one could say what Jesus did on that day was a fake or a fraud or done, done with smoke and mirrors, right? It's about timing. So what am I supposed to do about God's timing, right? Well, it's this third truth we need to look at. God's timing teaches us to trust him. There's a song that my congregation likes to sing. It's an old one, but we sing, we pull back every now and then. And it goes like this, strength will rise when we wait upon the Lord, when we wait upon the Lord, when we wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise when we wait upon the Lord. And we're clapping and we're worshiping, but to tell the truth, we hate waiting on the Lord, right? We, we want things now and, and, and we get confused. And listen, God says, just trust me. His timing teaches us to wait and trust in him waiting on the Lord to act on our behalf or for someone else, it takes trust. It takes faith, brothers and sisters. It takes standing on the promises of God that he's made to us and holding fast to those promises despite the circumstances around us. I love Isaiah 40. Those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up like eagles, walk and not grow weary. They will run and not faint. If we rest in God's timing, we will trust God more and more and more. Now, the third foundational truth that we want to look at with Mary, Martha, Lazarus, they learned about God's power, God's power. And there's three facts here that we want to look at. First is this, raising Lazarus demonstrated the power of God over death. I mean, those people who are around that tomb got an incredible, incredible illustration of God's power, an example of the omnipotent power of God. John chapter 6, verse 57, uh, Jesus said, I live by the power of the living Father who sent me. In the same way, those who partake of me will live because of me. Jesus promised to those living in him, partaking of him, his power. And his power far exceeds my crisis. His ability far surpasses my fears and my doubts. God is able. In fact, he's more than able. He's more than sufficient 
for anything that you and I may ever face or go through. We can rest in his awesome power, even in the midst of crisis. Mary and Martha, they both confessed to Jesus Christ. We know you could have done something if you're here, but now he's dead. But we do believe that one day he will be resurrected. And I love that, that, that part in scripture. Jesus just looks at, at them and says, I am the resurrection and the life. And those who believe in my in me, even though they should die, yet they will live again. Listen, I want to share this with you. You and I, we're going to make it through this crisis. You're going to make it through your troubles and problems you're going through right now because Jesus is the resurrection and the life. And if we know him as Lord and Savior, we are living in that same resurrection power of the Holy Spirit dwelling in us right? Your crisis, your troubles, your heartaches, they're in his hands and he has the power to see us through and he will see you through. The power that raised Lazarus, that raised Jesus resides in you through the Holy Spirit. Secondly, raising uh, uh, Lazarus uh, from the dead affirmed Jesus' identity as being truly the Messiah, God in the flesh, Emmanuel, you know, every mental uh, health facility has patients who believe they're Jesus Christ. I've met a couple. And there are leaders of cults and who claim to be Christ. How can you tell the real Christ from the frauds? Well, simply ask them to raise the dead. See if they can breathe new life into a corpse that's been four days in the grave. I love this part of the, the this account. Verse 43, then Jesus shouted, Lazarus, come out. And Lazarus came out bound in grave cloths with his face wrapped in a head cloth. And Jesus told them, unwrap him and let him go. Listen, if Jesus hadn't called out Lazarus' name specifically when he shouted, every dead body in that cemetery would have risen from the grave and come forth. That's how powerful Jesus Christ is. Every grave would have been emptied. What a sight that would have been. Third thing we learn about God's power is this. God wants to demonstrate his power in our lives to resurrect what's dead in us to new life in Christ. Now, part of the resurrection means we will be raised with him at the end of time. When we, uh, our spirit goes immediately to be with the Lord when we die, our body back to the earth, but there will be a day when our bodies are resurrected, that we'll get a new heavenly body. But that resurrection power is also for today. The very same Jesus who raised Lazarus from the dead wants to prove himself strong and powerful in your life. And he shouts your name. And he says, rise from this terrible place of fear and doubt and worry that you're going through and hold my hand. I will not let you go. See, Jesus wants to resurrect in us dreams that have died, passions for ministry that have died, callings that have grown old, and buried away. He wants to resurrect new faith in us to believe for the unbelievable so we can do the impossible. And let me assure you again, uh, as a practitioner, not a theoretician, in the midst of crisis, we can have the peace of God that passes all understanding if we will rest in the truth that God is in control, that you're the focus of his attention and heart. He sees you and he'll see you through this event the season of your life, no matter how horrible and awful it seems right now, he will see you through and cause you and others around you to glorify God for his care and his awesome ability to bring good out of what seemed so bad. Listen, remember God's faithfulness to you in the past. God has a great track record of taking care of us, doesn't he? especially in times of crisis and troubles. And he's not about going to change that. He's faithful even when we're not. So I want to just encourage you, brothers and sisters, when it's dark and when sleep is hard to find and the world is crashing in on you, call upon him. Speak his name, Jesus. Jesus. Turn your eyes to him. Look full into his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. When you're going through that crisis time, read John chapter 11 again. 
Read of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. Go back to these notes. Look at what, what Jesus is doing here and believe. Believe and trust in him. Trust in him. He will see you through. Well, brothers and sisters, let's, let's pray here. And I, I do pray for you. If you're going through a crisis right now, a situation, just please put your hand in the hand of Jesus Christ. He loves you. He died for you. If you haven't given your heart and life to him, what are you waiting for? I mean, heaven begins the moment we say yes to him. So just, just uh, say, yes, Jesus, I, right, I am sorry for my sins. I repent for them, but I realize you died for them on the cross for me. And Jesus, uh, you rose from the dead. And that was God's yes. That was God's aff affirmation of your sacrifice. Your work was done. And now that resurrection power resides in all of us who believe. The power of the Holy Spirit, your awesome power. You will see us through this crisis. I know you will. For each one of my listeners and viewers here, I know you'll see us through. And we can trust you. We can trust your timing. We can trust your will. For you have nothing but our good in your heart. And we thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. I thank you for watching. I hope that uh, lifted up your spirit and that uh, if you are going through a crisis right now, I hope it's given you some hope and some tools to, to walk with. And, and if you are not, praise God, but I bet you've got people in your life that are. Share these biblical truths with them. Walk with them. Be the hands and feet of Christ for them. For that's God's will, that we grow more and more to be like Jesus himself. Well, the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you. May he be gracious unto you. And may he establish your body, mind, soul, and spirit. Establish you in his peace, his shalom. God bless you. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.